So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And to me, even though this is a very good title for a session, um, I, I would remove the question mark uh, entirely. I don't see this as an optional variable for us to debate whether or not connectivity is a strategic game changer. To the extent that, as Pablo mentioned, it is at, at, at such a greater scale, extensity, velocity than any time in history. So it has always been a critical part of strategy. Uh, when I write about the historical role of connectivity, I, of course, go back to Roman roads, British railways, and so forth. We've always been battling over connectivity, but I believe that is going to be ever more the case in the future. So let me jump right in, and I think that we can't talk about these things and we can't internalize them in the way that Angela rightly wants us to unless we visualize them. We're a visual species after all. So let's bear in mind that all of the maps that hang here in the European Commission and in every office building in the world and every classroom in the world don't show you connectivity. They only show you division. They only show you national boundaries. We inculcate our children and we grow up our entire lives actually believing that the political map of the world is the natural map of the world, which is the ultimate irony because it changes so frequently that there's nothing sacred about a political map at all. So I wanna start with facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground is, is this. This is the map you've never seen that is a more real map of the world than the maps that you actually use because this shows you the things, not the borders that we inherited from the British or French empire, but the, the lines of connectivity that we actually voluntarily have been building, especially over the last uh, three quarters of a century since the end of World War II. But we've actually been building physical connectivity across our boundaries between particularly cities. I heard some people talking about that earlier. Really building connectivity among pop across population centers for thousands of years, and it's really been accelerating, accelerating. And that comes in layers. This word connectivity is so amorphous to people. It's so intangible. People think connectivity and they think, oh, you know, I, I, I'm connected, and they, they say, well, it's wireless, right? They don't appreciate the physical foundations. But we don't have global trade, we don't have financial networks, we don't have internet communications without a physical infrastructural underpinning. A connectivity is a physical thing. And it fits into a variety of categories, some of which I've visualized here. Transportation networks are the oldest and most obvious, all of the world's highways and railways and so forth. Then there's the energy networks, all of the oil and gas pipelines, electricity grids, and then only the newest layer. The internet is only the newest layer of this dense connectivity. Now, of course, we've had telegraph cables since the 19th century. Now we have hundreds of fiber optic internet cables coating the ocean floor, again, linking every continent to each other. This does something, right? This changes the patterns of human relations. It changes the patterns of international relations, changes the patterns of trade and economic relations. And it doesn't do away with geography. This is not the end of geography. This is not the end of the state. This is a new and much more complicated landscape that is created as a result of connectivity. We still have physical and natural geography. We still have the political geography. The, the irony of people who talk about the end of the state and so forth is that we have more states than ever before, right? We create more countries all the time. Just in the last month, there were a couple that tried to put themselves on the map. Uh, they didn't quite make it this time, but they probably will eventually. Um, and so if you want to understand the complexity of the world today, you have to appreciate all of these layers at the same time. This is not an either or. You don't get either or in the real world. In the world of scenarios, you posit either or and multiple scenarios so you can understand different pathways, but reality always winds up being some mix of them. And that's exactly what's happening in the world today. If you want to understand the impact of migration flows on political stability, if you want to understand how financial crises ricochet around the world, you can't explain it simply by looking at a political map. You can't certainly look at understand it by looking at a map of na natural geography. You have to layer in the connectivity. So it's not about one or the other but all of them, and that's cartographic complexity. So let me jump into how this impacts certain specific geographies. Let's just take the most obvious geography right here in Europe, which of course leads the world in transnational physical uh, connectivity. I think we, I don't need to rehash the story for anyone in this room around what, what impact that has had on European uh, relations, from the ways in which economies have come together to if you look at energy markets, this is just the oil and gas pipelines leaving out uh, um, 
uh, leaving out uh, electricity grids and so forth, you find that this is the best evidence alongside the euro uh, that Europe is an egg that is very hard to unscramble, right? Uh, a country like Germany wants to go non-nuclear in energy, but of course imports French nuclear power, right? It's very, very difficult. And the, and the more, the further along we go in terms of uh, re-regulating and harmonizing various sectors of the European economy, the more difficult it would ever become to, to, uh, to untangle it. And we see more and more efforts at transnational infrastructure, coordination around utilities, uh, banking systems, telecoms, and so forth. So in every possible sector, you see more coordination. And as an aside, other regions are copying that model. I find it high, supremely ironic. I mean, the last 10 years now since the financial crisis and people talking about the end of Europe and the collapse of Europe, this is exactly the, the decade in which uh, Latin America, uh, Southeast Asia, East Africa, and other parts of the world are saying, you know what, Europe really did something right. We need to copy that model. Um, and they're doing their best to try and emulate this map. Um, the emerging markets really are. I think what's so interesting from a geopolitical standpoint, to take just one example, is looking at Euro-Russian relations. Because if you think about uh, your, your uh, uh, Russian threats of cutting off uh, particularly gas flows to Ukraine while also wanting to build Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2, you create the opportunity for Germany to uh, facilitate reverse flows of gas to Ukraine via Poland. So you have Russia pursuing one policy of isolation towards Ukraine, while on the other hand, selling gas to its largest customer that then recycles it back to Ukraine, potentially. So you've got, again, you can't see that, you can't even appreciate how infrastructure impacts geopolitics unless you map out the physical connectivity that makes these that makes geopolitics so much more complicated than simply saying one country's army marches across the border, takes some territory, and that's it. It's a lot more complicated than that. And the point of the story is also that it's also at the value of the infrastructure. At the end of the day, the the terrain, the the post-industrial, the not unproductive post-industrial terrain of eastern Ukraine is not nearly as valuable as the flows of commodities through pipelines, right? So if you're not mapping that, you're also not even understanding the psychology of the players involved, where more and more we're thinking about the lucrative nature of the infrastructural assets rather than simply territorial aggrandizement in some 19th century sense. And I've seen way too many magazine covers that have said, um, you know, uh, Putin is the new Stalin and this is the 19th century czarism returning. It's nothing of the sort. Right, nothing of the sort. There are inherent limitations to what any territorial power can take from any other territorial power today without incurring very significant costs. They are much better served in their interests. And if you look at what they're doing, what they're actually pursuing is trying to control this connectivity over the infrastructure, which is so much more valuable. Now let's look at how connectivity plays out from the standpoint of the, the fact that all of this infrastructure has facilitated such an enormous volume of global economic flows, particularly in trade. It's been an article of faith, it's been a, 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 a sort of a macroeconomic fact that the most dense economic relationship in the world since the end of the, uh, since, since in the post-Cold War era has been the transatlantic relationship, which has reached more than $1 trillion of trade, goods and services every single year. But there's limited upside to that now if you think about the slow growth in Europe and in the US and the lack of progress on the TTIP and, uh, and so forth, and generally some soft protectionist measures, particularly coming out of the US. So you could, if we were to reconvene in, in 10 years, uh, you know, chances are that transatlantic trade volumes might be 1.5, 1.6 trillion, something like that. Not, not particularly special. Now, if you start to aggregate Europe's trade relations with Asia, Right, and Asia is not one thing, it's not the European Union, it's not the Asian Union, but it has very distinct economic pillars like China, India, South Korea, Japan, ASEAN, Australia, and so forth. If you add that up today, today, not, we don't have to do futurism right now, uh, today it's already $1.6 trillion. It's already a lot more. So you Europeans in this room, you have more substantial, more significant, far more significant trade relations today with Asia than you have with America. Right. So already we're past this idea of the transatlantic economic axis and anchor of the world economy. We are way past it. And the interesting thing here is that typically what it takes to get to that point where you have such intensity of volume of trade relations 
is not just simple supply and demand, but you would expect to have free trade agreements and very, very uh, frictionless infrastructural linkages, right? You have neither with Asia, and yet already you have more trade with Asia. You have only have a free trade agreement with uh, Singapore, I guess, and uh, South Korea, uh, not yet with India, not yet with Japan, although there's there talk about it, and you haven't even granted market economy status to China. And despite that, you have more trade with Asia. So what comes next? The trade agreements are being negotiated and the infrastructure is being built. So again, the, the connectivity as a strategic game changer is, most, is best physically embodied in the Belt and Road Initiative, right? The, the new Silk Roads and so forth. So what I've done is to kind of, all the, all the countries on this map that I've been traveling to a lot over the last 20 years, I go them, I go there and I say, what are the projects you want to build? What are the railways, the pipelines, the internet grids, uh, the, the internet cables, the electricity grids, and so forth that you want to take multilateral money or Chinese money uh, or European money and build? And who do you want to connect to most? Who, are your, who do you see as the, the most important future trade partners and so forth? And you get a map like this that really shows you pretty much exactly what the Belt and Road project is going to look like over the next quarter century, how it's going to unfold. And as you know, you already have dozens of trains a week going back and forth between southern China, across Central Asia, uh, to Western Europe, to Germany, and back, and you have European uh, um, uh, uh, sort of commercial actors capitalizing on the two-way flow more and more. So I expect this to, to really flourish in the coming, uh, coming decades. No matter what you hear about backlash against China, suspicion about China, uh, I've heard it all. I go to those countries. I go to Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Myanmar, everywhere. I, I know every story about the backlash against China. But still, what you're talking about here is a set of countries that are either post-colonial or post-Soviet. They're overpopulated, they're poor, they are frail. They desperately need very, very significant inflows of infrastructure finance, and they're finally starting to get it. Um, it matters less to them who it comes from than that, it, that it's there. And whatever backlash exists is, is more than overcompensated by the desperate need they have for it. So I fully expect this map to be built, and it's being built every single day. And Europe, you would, wouldn't be, uh, as you all know all too well, is a very active participant uh, in this. When the Obama administration wanted European governments not to sign on to the AIB, all of you did it anyway. And I think you did the right thing because you were looking at this and seeing the trade data, right? So there's all this talk about Europe is weak, Europe has no strategy, Europe has no plan. It, it may be there on paper and people don't see it translating in reality, but on the ground in terms of the way European commercial actors are operating, and the way decision-making is playing out, um, it clearly isn't articulated in one provocative way, but it is happening. There is this convergence uh, happening economically uh, between, um, uh, between Europe and Asia, and, and, and this is what it looks like. And this also has a significant impact on the ways in which uh, we, we deal with states of concern, states that, again, there's very significant transatlantic discrepancy about how to deal with Russia, how to deal with Turkey, how to deal with Iran. The more connected a country becomes, even North Korea, the, the, the actual impossibility takes shape of ever actually successfully isolating that country. That's, again, an iron law, if you will. And so it'll be very difficult to isolate countries the more connected they get. Just look at uh, what we hear about um, Chinese strategy towards uh, North Korea. We hear about China coming on board and starting to you know, cut off internet cables and so forth. There is almost nothing that China provides North Korea that Russia cannot substitute for and is already substituting for when it comes to energy, resources, and other sorts of things. So connectivity is most definitely a game changer. So final point that I just want to make because I'm, I'm out of time, but I see the kind of diagram of world power playing out uh, a lot more like this than the kind of very conventional unipolar or G2 sorts of cliches and visions. Uh, we're actually entering a truly un unprecedented era. This is something that is in fact new. We've never lived in a time where every continent or every region of the world actually mattered at the same time and where they had in De decreasingly hierarchical relationships with each other. We no longer have a global colonial sort of, you know, unipolar uh, imperial system, nothing of the sort. We have voluntary relationships across all these regions. We have, if you pick any two pair of regions in the world, whether it's South America with Africa or Asia with Africa or Middle East with South America, you see triple or quadruple digit growth rates in the intensity of trade and investment relations between them. And this is all voluntary. There is no power at the center, not the United States, not China, that can turn this system on or off. And that's, that, that's what's interesting about globalization that you have to understand. That when people talk about deep globalization, what they're actually saying is that their own country from 
their own perspective, appears to be playing less of a role in the global system. But globalization doesn't stop just because, just look at the TPP agreement as a perfect example. Everyone wrote about Trump's pulling the US out of TPP as if it would be the death of global trade. Instead, you had all the other countries say, actually, we're gonna go ahead with TPP. That's the way globalization works. It works around any obstacle. And that to me is truly new. That's a global network order. And of course, it would not be possible without the force of connectivity. It has positive implications and negative implications, right? I think that it's a more stable order. I don't think you can map 19th century European uh, history in terms of thinking about uh, whether or not unipolar or multipolar orders are most stable onto a global landscape where geography actually matters more um, in terms of the distribution of power. You have to view it in the novel as a novel situation that it actually is. And it has negative implications because, of course, when it comes to uh, even uh, Belt and Road and other infrastructure initiatives, you're going to see a lot more comp competitive tension over controlling those assets uh, and the value of those assets. You can already imagine what will happen when there's debt defaults uh, in countries. Countries that, that, that owe a lot of money to China for their energy grids and the asset seizures that are going to take place. That is connectivity as a battlefield. It's, it's a huge economic multiplier for the world economy. It's a great boon for global society as a whole. It is the reason why countries like China and India are less poor today. It is the cause of all of those positive things. But we also have to switch our minds uh, to realize that, that just looking at borders and tensions across borders is not even a fraction of the real geopolitical story when it comes to what we'll be fighting about in the future. It's going to be more and more connectivity as well. Thank you.